So, um, some discussion. So, uh, okay. Um, well, out of one truck, many. Um, so, these are sharper too. Um, one of the things that you know, I, I thought was a little bit undershot by the teams uh, for this deliverable was um, some of the issue tracking. And I wanted to hit on this uh, some for this class because tracking of issues is, uh, is very important. It's important for the team to coordinate, it's important the team to, to know what's done and what's not done. It's important the team to be clear on what the issues are, to make sure they're not duplicated, um, it's important for the team to know kind of where they're at in terms of product quality, um, say as the deliverable approaches uh, and trying to figure out is the feature going to stay or not, for example. It's really practical and, and issue trackers have over the years gotten more and more sophisticated. When I first started life in professional development, um, you know, we had an issue tracker. Uh, it was called, uh, I think it was called uh, bug hotel or something like that. And uh, it was a lot, a lot of a simpler system there, but the basic need was there from the get-go. And over the years, you know, they've acquired really sophisticated fun uh, functionality in terms of classifying things, in terms of searching them, identifying defects of certain types, classifying um, their point in the life cycle, et cetera. But a lot of the essentials were there even from, even from the early eighties uh, or from the late eighties. And uh, I want to ask you, before I talk a little bit about what makes a good bug report, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with this and why they're so important, I wanted to, to ask you, um, what important what information is important to include in a, in a defect report or include in a, in a uh, system trouble incident that's recorded in one of these systems? Uh, yeah, Lee. How do you create issue? Okay, yeah. Um, so how to recreate it. Um, if we have a putative defect, if we have a defect we think is there, um, presumably we're entering it so it can be quashed, it can be dealt with, right? Or at least it can be investigated. And um, knowing how to recreate it is kind of foundational. Um, and it should be fairly specific about how to recreate it. And, and this often takes testers quite some time to go from kind of a, well, there's some weird inconsistency that occurs um, occasionally to like, click this, click that, load this, boom. Um, finding the, the conditions under which the uh, failure occurs, or the, the defect is manifested. It's not always trivial. And in fact, sometimes it can take a long time to kind of boil it down to the minimum requirement. Because you do a bunch of stuff in exploratory testing, and then it comes about, and it's not clear what of the things you just did, you know, uh, led to this. And so you've got to kind of wheedle it down, wheedle it down until you, you have the minimum set, right? So that's really important. And Lee is, is bang on with that. What else what might you include in a defect report besides a recreation formula? Yeah, Jeremy. Your software version at the baseline. Yeah, software version. Why is the software version so important? That's right. You might already fix it. It's just like something that's already in an old version. Yeah, yeah. So it's someone with an old version of the software that's maybe no longer supported, or maybe you know that whole area of the system has been replaced since there, since then, right? Sometimes it isn't quite, quite even so simple as that. Sometimes it's you know. Oh, they're using this with an iPhone 4, and that version of the software didn't support iPhones, you know, uh, before the certain version or, or whatever it was. Um, so sometimes it's an incompatibility between the user system or the system on which it was experienced and, and the version of the software. That's the relevant combination. But yes, the version of the software is, is foundational. A lot of it is because we want to know, like, is this bug still in our system or is this defect still going to be manifested or could it just be a, an outdated one? So, so really important. Um, and I think there was something, I'm trying to remember your initial wording of it, but 
sometimes it's an issue also of whether it's a duplicate. Like, like maybe, maybe you see this defect or you see this failure occur, right? You see it in the, the issues database. But what you want to know is this sounds, maybe it sounds a lot like a defect you saw two months ago. Is it the same one or is it, you know, the one we quashed then and that ver old version? Or is it a new one that came about that looks the same, but it's, you know, it's in a different, totally different version of software, right? And this has to do with this problem of regression, which we'll be talking about a fair bit. Regression. I introduced this term before. Does anyone remember what it was when we talked about defects? What do you mean by a, a regression, a regression defect? There's actually two uses of this. And I introduced them in this very room. Not uh, three weeks since. I think it's three weeks ago. Um, anyone remember what the two uses were? These are of, of central interest. Yes. These sort of defects. What's that? Yes. Uh, so this the shine three is exactly right. This is tied up this notion of regression here is what gives a name to this process of regression testing regression testing is trying to identify regressions it's trying to identify defects that are regression defects that's why we engage in regression testing is to to discover this but these are especially important types of defects for two separate reasons. This is like gold for like pop courses. It's also gold for the final exam. Mm. So um, yeah, get, get the pens out and so on. Um, so uh, what are the two? What are the two uses of the term regression? Anyone? German. Uh, something that we work with, but it's no longer. Bingo. So. Um, I'll say, uh, you know, work feature, I'll, I'll put it in shorthand, feature stops working. The stop connotes that it did work, right? Um, and it ceases working. Why is that important? Why is that of particular interest that a, that a defect ceases working? Why is that a particular? Particular concern. Really bad. I don't even think it was three weeks ago. It was more than ten days ago. I uttered the comments on this. Why is this a particular concern? Yeah, we. It's typically uh, pretty bad. Like if you do that, if you press a new functionality, you don't want to get rid of something that yeah. the users are yeah. using. Yeah, like new features rolled out by a system over time are great. People would like to see them, and you know, they hear about this great new feature in Google Docs, and they want to use that and see it and, and use it. But and and you know, if it doesn't work that well, if it's if it's flaky, they'll be disappointed. But what really gets people's goat, what really gets them upset sometimes, what really you know causes anger and and sometimes lawsuits, is if a feature that they're counting on working like that hundreds of their documents in Google Doc count on suddenly stops working. That's A1 bad. It's like you've added negative value, right? It's like the new version, you know, took away value they had previously. They thought they were secure, but you took it away, right? All their tables suddenly look like gobbledygook or no fi figure shows properly. You're, or you know this font is no longer supported suddenly the report they have to print out looks looks like it's in greek or whatever um that's not good so so this is much worse than a new feature not working this is like a one bad this is like customers call you up and scream over the phone at the customer support representative because it stops working so that's really bad there's another one that's bad because it's very common it's not necessarily that it's particularly horrible. It's just high probability. 
remember when we talk about badness, there's two ways you can have things that are really bad, right? One way is if the outcome is really bad, the other is the outcome is, you know, it's bad, but it's really common that it occurs. What's this other one that's really common also goes by the name of a regression? Confusing. It's also try, we try to spot it with regression test. Yes, Lee. When you get a couple of uh, a couple problems that you kind of top of fix, uh, top of top of it. Yeah, exactly. 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 So, so this is like old defects reemerge. Um, and we talked about why that is um, before. Um, that defects remark. We talked about a couple of reasons they remark. Give me one or two. These are like exam. This is like golden exam material. Why, why would they remark? Give me one or two reasons at least that they'll remark. Anyone? What one? Why would, why would a bug reemerge like a zombie? You, you put it to rest. You thought you had the state through its art and it, it comes back. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. Um, remind me. Name? Sorry? Spencer. Spencer. Yes. I was never really gone. I was never really gone. Yeah. So, so that it, maybe the dev reported it as fixed, but maybe, maybe they only fixed it in a small subset of cases. Maybe they didn't really understand what it meant. And they, they thought it meant one thing and it really meant another thing. Um, so maybe, maybe they didn't really fix their. You know, maybe they they uh, marked it as fixed, thinking it was done, but without really checking it. Yeah. Um, so that's one reason it might reemerge. What's another reason it might re reemerge? Um, maybe someone pushed their code to the repository. They were having like they didn't make a pull request before that, and they yes. just pushed it. Yeah. So it was the version which had the bugs. Well spent. Well said, exactly. So the idea is look, before I feel like shouting this. I think I think the folks down the hall could find it. One time I was giving a lecture in a building of about this size, and I was told the, the rest of the whole building can hear my lecture. Um uh because I have a, a voice that can project. But before you push, Paul, I Paul, and make sure you have the latest code from other people. Because you want to be sure that your code runs with the latest changes contributed by others, right? Because otherwise, you're going to push, and your code might not even compile with their code. Or it may compile, but it, it doesn't play nicely together, right? And they may have fixed the defect on their side, elsewhere in the code base and when you push your code there's going to be a merge conflict and someone may miss their fix right and just sort of include your code so um so bugs re-emerge a lot because old code is resurrected or people or you know a bug pops out anything elsewhere and someone goes to fix that and tries to fix that by breaking this one again and and it goes back and forth you know it's like a balloon you squeeze it here it pops out there you squeeze it there it pops out over here i think we've all been in that situation before maybe too many late night sessions for us right yeah okay so all defects reemerge frequently and when we run regression tests we're looking for both of these. And one of the things that you might keep track of is whether this is a regression be a bug or whether it's it's a new one. And one way of doing that, one important piece of information for this is what is per Jeremy's comment, what is the version on which this is occurring? Because if it's an early version of the system, oh, this is just that defect. The first time, if it hasn't come back, it just, you know, it's just in its original form. If it's a new version of the system, it's back. 
right? Um, and we've got to deal with it. So, so this is really important. Um, the, the version, whether it's a regression or not, is important. And whether a feature that was working before is stopped working, or whether we're dealing with a version of the software, which you know was before it was fully working. Or something. So for sensing regression, version is really important. What else would be in a defect report? Anyone? Sorry, yes. Kind of a system configuration requirement, so that like the person who will be recreating that thing, yeah. they know what kind of dependencies and yeah. configurations were used. I think this is this is a good point. I mean, you, you want so you want to provide all the information they need to recreate it. Some of that is like the steps in the system, click here, do this, enter that, blah, 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 load this file, boom. But but some of it is in the config of the system. And you know, many of the times these days, development is done with with respect to standardized configurations enforced by containerization or virtual virtualization, et cetera. We have people on precisely the same system, not to the bit level. You know, it's the same system that they're running. But if, if you're not in that situation, because you're working with special hardware, right? Or you're working with emulators, you can't use containerization easily or whatever. Um, Making sure you have the right set of node.js libraries or right version of Jest or you know right version of Dart and Flutter um, is really important. Yeah, so good. How about other things? There, there's some very basic things which which are almost freebies here if you think about them. Um, yeah, uh, name again. Sid. Sid. Yes. Thank you. Uh, result yeah what did you expect to happen right um and what actually did happen it forces you to think that through right because sometimes you say oh that's a mistake and then you really think about it oh yeah i guess that is <laughs> it did it correctly right um so sometimes that happens but it, it allows the tester or the person the developers have designed this to know what your expectations were, make sure that they were aligned with, with their own, and to be able to start debugging it quickly. So Sid's exactly right. So understanding expected versus actual behavior. How about anything else that would be reported in a bug report? Yes, uh, name again? Oh. Uh, oh. 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 Okay. Oh, sorry? Oh, yeah, okay, good. So like if it if it's interfering with successful execution of a test of a formal test, like test case 39 or something like that, you record that. Excellent. And why is that really valuable? If that's the case, um, if this wasn't just encountered in exploratory testing according to no script, but instead it came about because of either manual testing according to a test case. You should write down, you should have some manual tests that you undertake that are scripted, right? You, you do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. Um, or maybe it's an automated test through Selenium or through some sort of test runner um, or calling directly these functions to recreate a use case. Um, if it's a test case, it's really valuable to know that because you can easily rerun it. The, the developer, could run that test case and see if it fails, see if it, presumably on a standardized configuration or the correct configuration, it should fail. And then they'll try to fix it and then make sure it succeeds. So that is great information. Exactly right. Okay. These are a good set of things. There's also a bunch of very basic things. Yeah. Uh, the person reporting the above. Yeah, person reporting the above. That's key. Um, so that the, the dev might know who to talk to for any clarifications about it and so on. Um, yeah, uh, the error message. Yeah, the error message. So yeah, what's the manifestation of the, like what, how do you know a failure occurred? Like what, what was said, right? Was it a, was it a stack dump? Um, was it a, a report of an exception? 
Um, what, what line number and file did it report associated with that, et cetera? These are all really important. What, what you know, did it say database timeout or disk full or, you know, cannot connect or, you know, uh, corruption error or what? That, that's often a big clue. So that's exactly right. Um, yeah. Name it again. Uh, Jorgen. Jorgen. Jorgen, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, so any log messages, uh, particularly log, log messages, uh, like the whole log file you might attach, yeah. might attach it to there. If you can't do that, at least like the last bunch of messages in the log file so that you can see that. These are all excellent, excellent. Anyone want to say one, one other? Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't think we have to belabor this point too much. You've actually hit most of my my comments here about um, uh, that I, I want to make about the essentials of this. Um, so defect tracking systems are are absolutely essential. Um, they have been essential to professional software development since the 80s, and they've grown ever more sophisticated because they deliver a lot of functionality. Um, they're a key tool for coordination. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things, though, that I want to talk about that haven't been, a, uh, been you know, discussed here. Um, and there's three uh, particular ones that I want to focus on here, okay? Um, so one thing is uh, the priority, another severity, and another the status. Uh, there's some others um, as well. Notice some of these, like whether it's a regression or not, uh, is indicated what area of the project who it's to whom it's assigned. This is really important among the devs because if someone's already working on it, you don't want another developer starting to work on it, right? You want to be able to marshal. You you want in your team, in your development team, you want to be both effective and efficient, and you know not not having two people working on the same bug independently, not wearing it is, is not efficient, right? So you want to assign it to someone. But let's, and, and you know, the reproduction formula was mentioned earlier, it's exactly right. But let's talk about priority. So this gets to this kind of issue of why things are bad. Look, priority is how important it is to fix. And there's two things that factor into that. Can you give me two things that you might consider when you're considering whether to fix something or not? You know, when you judge how important this is to fix, what are two things? Yes. Uh, so firstly, we have to see like what's the impact of that particular work, and secondly, the, the amount of efforts to fix it. Okay. Okay. Those are good, good things to think about. The how bad it is is actually also considered by severity. Severity is like, if it occurs, how bad is it? Okay, and that's what the severity is. And you're right, the priority reflects that. It, it takes that into account, but that's not everything, right? Um, how, how difficult it is, how, how feasible it is to fix, that's pretty important. But there's another thing priority also will take into account. What is that? Anyone? Yes, Lee. How common it is, yeah. If this occurs only really, really rarely, you know, it's one out of every 10,000 times you start the system, there's this race condition. Do, do folks have this notion of race condition? You know, there's, there's kind of two things competing. As long as, you know, if, if one finishes well before the other, there's no problem in it, these are harder. But if they finish very close to each other in time, you may get bad things happen. Like one gets one set of resources that the other needs, the other gets the other set, and they get deadlocked. And neither will release the resources to the other or whatever. Um, so there may be things like the concurrency and other factors that a really robust system would avoid, but some systems still experience it. You know, a glitch that comes about when there's a unusually long timeout in a congested network. Um, and you just decide, you know, it's so rare 
or maybe it's in a really old version of the system that you almost never see anymore. And, or, you know, a really low memory condition and a quite old version. Um, and you say, look, it'd be nice to fix this, but at the end of the day, it's not going to really deliver much value because almost no one uses those sort of systems anymore. It's really rare. And we have bigger fish to fry. We have, we have other things to work on that are higher priority. So, so priority considers, I, I like these, these three things. So often I talk about two, the likelihood it will occur and the severity if it does. But I like the one about, you know, you do want to consider how feasible it is to fix. Because if it's not feasible, if it's totally, it would require a giant set of changes or very risky changes, right? Changes that put the rest of the system at risk. You might say, you know, it's desirable and probable um, that that you'll fix it, for example, or even extremely probable. You just say, look, we'll we'll swallow this. At least we can give a workaround, right? This is one of the issues of, of defects in the in the in the issues database. You can warn about them. If they're in the issues database, you can write up for the priority, say one and two bugs. Uh, say maybe all priority one bugs are fixed, but priority two bugs are some, and you write up workarounds for each of them. And you warn the stakeholder, you know, make sure that, you know, you always give the system, you know, at least 10 seconds after closing it, closing the app before reopening it or something like that. Because if you reopen it too soon, it may not have written all everything out to Google Firebase or whatever. Um, and so you, you give them a workaround and you warn them about it. Or you say, you know, for names that are only a single name for the child, enter the same, you know, if they only have a last name and not a first name, enter, you know, enter the, the last name also as the first name or something like that. You give them a workaround, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, remember, fixing bugs has risks. We talked about fault feedback ratios. Um, anyone remember what that is? What's a fault feedback ratio? Fault feedback ratio. Yes. That's exactly right. When you fix an issue, what's the chance you create an one? If it's 0.5, it means it's a coin flip. When you go to fix it, you introduce another error. And believe it or not, for bug fixes of hundreds of lines, it's likely you'll introduce a new issue by trying to fix it. It's just too complicated. For things that are like, you know, one or two lines, you're doing really, really well when you have a fault feedback ratio below 30%. I think on average, about 30%. You might say, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Sometimes you, you fix it here, and again, it causes something over there. And, you know, it, it, it's not that you didn't fix this line in this context. It's just it pushes the issue somewhere else, right? Priority. Um, severity is how bad, it, how bad is it if it occurs? And What's what's something that's give me some examples of really bad things. What what's a really bad type of defect? Give me I have one give me some bad ones. Yeah, Lee. It, just, uh, the system. it crashes it. This is like this is like the archetypical, you know, um, frightening scenario for. For a computer scientist, right? It crashes. Yes, that's bad. There's another one that's just about the same level of, of sort of shakes our, our constitution. We know it can occur and it's bad, bad, bad when it occurs. What is it? Yes. Yeah, well, okay. Memory leak is, is really bad. <laughs> that's, that's really bad. Um, so is a dangling pointer. I can tell you. I can tell you stories. Um, I've chased down dangling pointers, memory leaks, worst of them two or three days each. 
uh, in a large complex C code base. Um, they're the worst of them are the highs and bugs. Like when you run it under a debugger, it goes away as a problem, but you run it other times and it shows up, but maybe it only shows up one out of a hundred times. Those are, oh man, those are, uh, those are the two or three days. Sometimes it's a nighter in there, um, but you eventually chase it down, hopefully before the deadline. Um, okay, uh, so that is bad. It's a lot of human effort. Yeah, what's, what's another thing? Yes, Jeremy. Deleting a part of data? Yes, that's, that's terrible. It's terrible. Deleting important data is, it's like negative value, right? You actually, it's not just that it crashed. By the way, the other one I was looking for, it's, it's hanging. What does hanging mean? The program hangs, what does it mean? Stop yeah, it stops responding. You know, it's just, it's wedged, right? Um, it, uh, it stops running, it's sort of halted. It's maybe it's in a loop that goes on forever or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Crashing and, and halting are, are not halting, excuse me, and halting are, you know, bad. Getting it wedged is, is bad. Yeah, it's bad. Um, but, but deleting data is worse because at least with the other ones, you can restart it, right? If data is deleted, it's, again, you, you've like taken something away. And that's like taking away functionality. It's bad, bad, bad. Corrupting data. Man, that's, that's like horrible. Um, data corruption is, 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 is a horrendous thing. A security issue is terrible. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a bad world. It's a bad world. Um, I, I don't know if you, probably each of you was at some point created a website or something, put it out on the internet. You know, if you look at the, the logs for those, you know, all sorts of script kiddies running against them. And, you know, it's very common to see like a dozen people trying to break into the site at night or something like that. Um, it's just like swarms of bandits, you know, like coming at you constantly, constantly. Um, and security issues, if you leave a vulnerability, you know, talk about negative value delivered. They may get a ransomware attack, right? Steals their data. And who they blame? They blame the software developers who left the security issue in. And you appear in front of the court of Queen's Bench or something like that. Um, well, okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's not a good thing when your clients think, blame you for a, a data breach, right? Um, uh, major functionality isn't working is, is bad and minor functionality. So these are some things, you know, you, you really want to, um, they hit on uh, priority versus severity. Severity is badness if it happens. Priority takes into account badness, but it takes account frequency of occurrence and, to, and it can take into account difficulty of fixing. And then there's the status. This is really, really important. This status, it's not like how prestigious is the bug, you know, it's a high status bug. No, it's, it's what's its current status in the bug life cycle. And I believe that I have, yes, here. Um, yes, and so the idea here is, look, um, bugs go through, through stages, right? I've shown you this before. Stages of a bug's life. Um, my, my, oh, don't tell me. Am I uh, sharing my screen? Oh no, I'm not sharing my screen. Okay, this is, this is horrendous. Well, it's fortunate that I, I was explaining most of these things verbally, but this is a diagram you really want to see. So, um, you know, bugs go through stages of life. There's the larvae stage and a pupae stage and an adult stage for real life bugs. But for software bugs, they go through a stage where their first form is undiscovered, right? You don't even know about them. There's the unknown unknowns. Like they're, they're out there, but you don't know about them. That's a terrible type of bug. You don't even know how many there are. And you don't know what type they are. And you should fear this as much as any sort of bug because this is 
a big question mark because you will meet these later, sometimes just before the ID2 deadline. Mark my words. Um, okay, so there's some testing that goes on, and you put together a bug report. But that bug report is not yet really, it's not really sanitized, it's not really vetted, it's not checked for, for significance. And there's a sanitization process which is required to turn it into an active bug. What sort of bugs might be in the bug report stage, but not at the active stage? Give me a, a few. What, what, why is it you have to go through the sanitization? Why might you not promote it to be an active bug? Speak use with a voice. Yes. Could we, um, could we duplicates? Um, yes, it could be duplicates is a giant reason. Tick one for Lee on that's going to be um, almost certainly on the final exam. Indeed. Um, give me another reason. That, so duplicates is a key one. This this uh, bug reports might include lots of duplicates. And for this, you'll be looking at the version to judge. Is it a duplicate? Is it the same? Is it a regress bug from earlier? It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it has the appearance of that early one. It just occurred in a later version. It was disappeared, but it was disappeared between them. It, it, it wasn't, it didn't exist between them. So it's a new bug with the same manifestation. Maybe it's, maybe the underlying cause is the same, the same, you know, basic reasoning issue. But yeah, there can be a lot of duplicates in here. The, you know, a bunch of testers report the same basic thing. Can't log in, right? Um, or this part of the system is really slow. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, could be a bug that's introduced by unreleased code. Uh, yeah, so uh, it could be code that shouldn't have been released for testing. Um, and and therefore, you know, it's it's not it's not actually in the code that should be subject to quality to formal quality checks and tracking with defect reports so so it was just an accidental testing that that led to this bug report and it was kind of an aberration of the process it's actually not in the repo so that's that's possible what other sorts of bug of, of issues might be be here that don't go through sanitization they don't cut the mustard yeah uh, it could be a bug uh yeah okay so this is a very good point there are these things called cascading bugs meaning there's a defect it causes a problem earlier and maybe because of that earlier defect there's a timeout and that causes a null pointer exception later or something like that um and so the problem is not necessarily the root problem is not the null pointer that, that's not a manifestation of the root problem directly. It's an indirect one. The, the, you know, the defect earlier was the kind of precipitating cause. And, and this one is just an outcome of that, right? So it's really secondary to that earlier one. Yeah, that, that can occur. That's quite right. Uh, it's a little bit iffy whether you keep that in there because maybe this is the first, maybe this no pointer exception is the first time you notice it. The other one was maybe a silent timeout you didn't notice and this is just the first manifestation but you're absolutely right that if if it's just a knock-on consequence of something earlier we might say just focus on that earlier problem that's the real problem not this that's that's the issue okay all of these ultimately though what we're recording with an issue database um from testing is normally Failures, they are failures of the system to behave as expected. They're trouble incidents. Um, they're different from the defects. The actual underlying defects generally aren't noted in testing. They're not, they're not what you see in testing. What you see is the failure, the debugging has to find the underlying problem. 
And this is in contrast. You know, I feel like standing on some of these tables and showing you. The underlying problem is located by bugging or by what other process that I am expecting you to undertake without fail for ID2. Well, let's see. And it's track by issue track. And, 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 and it can't go in issue track, the underlying problem, because it may be found in a what? It's in a peer review. In a peer review. And that peer review could be in the form of something that's required for each review. And then I want to see some, at least one or two for each team by ID2. And that is an. Ends with an I, ends with an N. Inspection. inspection. I want to see the inspections, right? Um, I want to see inspections. Uh, so, inspection is a, peer, a form of formal peer review. There's other informal forms of peer review, right? Uh, pair programming, pair desk check, just running by someone, um, having an area where people can look at code informally. Those are all great. Those are all essential. Those are all, you know, assumed in this class that of course you're going to do that, but you need to have inspections because these are the industry best practices that have revolutionized defining a bug. And these things, unlike testing, these things locate not just the failure, but the underlying, I don't want to crash your heart rate, fault. Okay. Uh, so that was enough to come back here. So, um, and so these things find the faults, whereas the testing finds the failures. And from these, you actually issue issues. You issue issues. You enter issues into the defect database as well. But these are often, you know, there's a problem directly in the code. The ones from testing, it's about failures, and that's why I say like. Is the null pointer exception worth entering, even though it's a knock on thing? Well, maybe it was the first one noted, so you're going to enter it. But once you really understand, the only time this occurs is this isn't the real manifestation. It isn't a early manifestation of the issue. This is just a much later thing. The real problem occurred early. We just didn't record it, and there was a time or whatever. Yeah. Very good discussion. Um, so, so bug reports here. The bug reports at this stage, um, before sanitization, have a lot of cruft in it, a lot of defect, a lot of duplicates, a lot of things that are outdated that are now fixed. You know, a lot of um, things that are based on misunderstandings or another thing that might be in there. Things based on versions that are not yet released or not official or whatever. Lots of things in there. Sanitization will sort of select out the bugs that are real worth, that are worth worrying about. They're not just duplicates, they're distinct. And they're also, you know, well enough documented to be clear. They seem like legitimate problems, not just misunderstandings. Da -da 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 -da. And those are active bugs, okay? And active bugs are marked typically in these databases. So whether it's active or not, okay? Um, but you'll notice that's, that's only early on. And then there's fixed, resolved, and closed. And those will come in late in the process. So it has the active bugs come up here and there's a process and hey, project manager, Jeremy, okay. Um, you should realize this is triage process. And the triage process basically involves deciding as the deliverable approaches um, the degree to which you're going to put your time into it to fixing uh, different defects. Sometimes you will decide that a given defect is not worth fixing. Mm -hmm. um, you will decide that uh, you don't have time. Or you will decide what? What's the other, what's another key factor about why you're not going to fix it? There, there are others, but there's a major one that's almost always present. 
That's the difference between the effort bar. Okay, the effort, yeah, it might not be this line to fix it, yeah. but often it's hard to directly measure time. But yes, time, time can be a bit of like, no way we can fix that. There's just no way. But Jeremy, you don't want to actually make it work. You don't want to make something worse. This is the devil we know. This is the thing we know about. We, we understand what this defect is. We know it's moderate severity. We know what a workaround is. If we go and try to fix it now, we may cause something worse. And worse yet, we may not have time to fix that. But worse yet, um, so um, worse yet, you might not even know about it because there's not time to run all the tests, right? You don't have time to go through the battery of tests before. And so you're not going to be able to write a workaround report. You're not going to be able to warn the stakeholder. You're not going to be able to document it for us, right? Um, like the intermediate concern. And, and so, so you often will decide, look, this one we can live with. We'll document it. And Osgood will give you a lot of credit for that. I can assure you of that. I'll talk about that. Um, uh, so, so the point is that we often make uh, conscious decisions about what to triage, what to take on and what to leave, what things we're going to put our limited time and effort into. Sorry for the English. Um, into what types of defect reports we're going to put our limited time and effort. And we promote those to important books. And then there are signs to developers. The dev takes it, works on it, and then they say fixed. They believe it's fixed. Why did I just say believe fixed? Uh, I don't know. Fairly definite answer. Is there any rocket science? Why, why do I just say believe fixed? Why not actually fix it? And, it? and it's not because they're blind or something. It's just, look, maybe maybe it fixed it for the particular case they were trying. Maybe it runs for their unit test. Or maybe their unit tests weren't sufficiently creative. Or maybe they only fixed it for kind of a subset of cases, right? Um maybe maybe they didn't understand the full set of conditions under which it occurs. Whatever the cause is, some a lot of the time things that are are um, believed fixed are things that are not in fact fixed, uh, and and they'll re be recreated. Um, so you know the the QA team, the testers should test these, and they should test: is it in fact fixed? The role of the, of the test team a lot of the time, or the reporter you may not. I'm not talking like a CDC reporter, I'm talking about who reported the defect, who reported the failure. You know, I'm, saying, I'm using that terminology, I'm saying the defect. It's a failure, it's an it's a observation of a, of a, a violated expectation, it's a trouble incident. Whether it's or not a defect, it remains to be seen. But the person who reports it might also be the one who checks, in which case it would be brought resolved, for example. And then there might be a final closure of it by which it's designated closed. Okay. So you have to realize just because someone says it fixed doesn't mean it is necessarily. And it's no, it's not to cast this version so that it's all. It's not saying the developer lying or or not being intelligent. It's just, you need to double check that. The reporter should double check it because they know what they saw or the tester who is often the reporter should double check it, make sure it's fixed. Because Osgood may double check it. You know, you may. Um, and, you know, at that point you, you could mark it resolved and eventually you know, completely close it. The, the, the terminology for these later stages, it, it might be you consider the closure at that point as well. 
Anyway, um, those are some things, ladies and gentlemen, and defect reports. Okay. Um, so you're going to want to track these things. And it's a lot of information there, more than you want to keep track of in Discord. So structured information, and it will change over time. And you want to go update it, you want others to look at it. You know, is that bug yet confirmed as resolved? And blah, blah, blah. Um, if, if it was um, not found, it, it, there was marked fix, but turns out they, you know, it still seems to be present. You might say it's again active and you kick it back to the person. I don't, I'm not sure why. It, oh, person open uh, by is the person who's the reporter, person assigned to is the developer. So you kick it back to the person to whom it was assigned, right? So in other words, if, if it's no longer fixed, you know, if, if they marked it as fixed and the tester finds it ain't fixed, like this is, this is not resolved, this is not fixed at an informal level, you kick it back, you mark it active and you kick it back to the person who was assigned to it. So, you know, you need to work on, on this some more. In this case, it still fails or whatever, okay? This is a living document. And when you close these things, the mark of resolved, at least close them, um, you have a sense of progress. You have a sense of velocity of your project, how quickly you're making process, you know, you're, you're making progress. Remember, you can count lines of code and so on, but if defects are accumulating in large numbers, you're, you may be fooling yourself because it's not really solid code yet. And, you know, the number of defects you have fixed is, is a really important measure and how many defects you have. But always never forget that, you know, just because you have all the defects fixed in your system, doesn't mean they're resolved yet. Just because you have them all resolved, doesn't mean you found all the defects yet. There may be lots back here. So when I try to judge a project's quality, I try to touch where it is on the quality scale. Um, I look at a lot more than just, you know, well, whether all the issues are resolved. I will, I'll be asking how much testing is going on? How many defects were reported in the first place? And what we're going to see in one of the later lectures is there's a way of estimating, a structured way of estimating how many undiagnosed bugs are out there. Believe it or not, it, it seems almost, you know, almost impossible, right? Uh, completely implausible, perhaps, that you can estimate something like this. Um, you know, how many bugs, how many defects are out there? We don't know about them yet. It seems almost contradictory. But there are ways of, of trying to estimate what this is. And that can give you some sense about where you're at as a project in terms of quality, okay? Um, so some pointers on, on defects, defect reports. And so on. Any questions about this? Yeah. So yeah, John. Like, so it's a great question. The this this sort of life cycle I've drawn here um, shows, you know, there's an entry. Through testing, there's an entry of bug reports, right? Who does the testing? You tell me. Who does testing on the bug? It's not a load bug. Who does the testing? Sorry? Testers do a lot of the testing. And, and the developers do quite a bit of testing. The developers should be doing unit testing routinely. Particularly according to test driven development, right? They should always be running these tests. So developers are doing tons of unit testing. Testers should be doing a lot more than unit testing. They can run some unit tests, but they should be doing system testing, doing exploratory testing, testing it through the UI, you know, in a black box sort of way. Um, do, do acceptance testing or testing end to end. All of those reasons are things that they should be, you know, entering things in. So who enters the bug reports? Who, who creates these? Testers do and developers do 
and end users do, right? Um, anyone you show it to and you might have access to this, anyone else on the team, um, maybe, maybe the project manager is trying it out, right? Maybe Jeremy or Shay are putting up the system and they know something but it's a report. Um, and then who is it that sanitizes the defects? Probably the testers, okay? They're the folks who will be going through and saying, oh, that's the one we saw before. Testers are going to get really familiar with these defects. I don't know if they become their friends or their frenemies or what, but they may feel a certain amount of pride they discovered some of them. So maybe they're friends. And then triage, well, that's going to promote it to serve important bugs. Often that doesn't require a big change here, but um, you know, it may lead to some saying won't fix or something. And that'll be the triage team, often the dev lead, the test lead, and the project manager or something. You know, developers are going to mark it as fixed, or you know, say, I, I, you know, it's assigned to the developers who's going to mark that up. The dev, dev lead will be responsible for marking it as who is assigned this to fix. Apologies for the English. And then resolve. This will be the tester or the reporter who will be who will be marking as resolved. Okay. So who takes responsibility for this database? It's a very good question. All the team members can touch this database, but the test team, the dev team, and for assigning defects to developers, particularly the dev lead, will often be key people. And often the test lead is, is one of the key people with triage and sanitization. Okay, so that should give you some sense. It's a team thing, it's not just one person. You know, touching it. It's not like the build master only can touch it. No, no, no. It's all team at different times and at different stages of filling this in and updating it. It's going to be different people touching it. And that's the point. It's a coordination tool, a communication tool. It's a tool for, you know, uh, coordinating around finding these defects and fixing them. And validate whether they're important and worth fixing, et cetera. Okay. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, that's all we have time for. I appreciate the uh, lots of feedback I'm getting here. Um, I will have office hours at 5 p.m. So it's not not right now, but uh, it's in another hour or so. Okay. Uh, hope to see some of you then. I'll be on Zoom and I'll I'll be there in person. Take care there. Thank you.